Welcome everybody. Um, I am going to pass this over to Ken Vinciano and he will open up our program today. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Rebecca. Appreciate it. And thank you all for joining our meeting today. Um, we were supposed to have this back in March before uh, things got crazy with the pandemic. So we've uh, rescheduled and uh, we're actually supposed to do it at the Battery at the Cumberland Group office. So I wanted to uh, thank them. They're one of our sponsors for the event still. Um, hopefully we can have an event over there in the future once things open up again. Uh, in the interim, just again, wanted to, I uh, hope you all are, are safe and, and healthy and your families are safe and healthy. Um, like to just acknowledge our sponsors just at the start. So we have, we have two annual sponsors this year. We have uh, Tableau and Calibra. So I wanted to thank them for supporting us throughout the year. And uh, the Cumberland Group is sponsoring us for this specific event. So uh, many thanks to them and all of our sponsors. Without them, this, this wouldn't be possible. Um, just some housekeeping items for some of you, you know, this may be your first tag data governance meeting. If, if it is, I'd like to welcome you. Um, you know, we're trying to put on some zoom events since we can't do live events at the moment. Uh, you know, the group kind of has three pillars of focus, content, collaboration, and networking. Uh, and, you know, we try to bring, you know, top of mind content to the group kind of, um, get them talking about these topics, sharing approaches and knowledge and, you know, collaborating and then networking is another key aspect. So we do have networking events as well. Below you'll see the preliminary event schedule for the year. We've had to shift obviously, uh, but this is as of now, our, our next live event is scheduled for October 1st, but that may very well be uh, via Zoom or it may be you know, partially live and, and, you know, maybe a panel is live and then people can, can access it via Zoom. And then we have our executive exchange scheduled for December 3rd. That's an invite only event. We're doing that this year with the Data Science and Analytics Society. It's going to be a joint event. So uh, looking forward to that. And both of those are scheduled at the, the TAG North Metro office in, in Alpharetta. So again, you know, keep an eye on the calendar. We'll keep you informed. Thank you for, for joining this. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Bill Franks. Bill is the Chief Analytics Officer at the International Institute of Analytics. I've known Bill for a number of years around town. He was uh, over at Teradata. He was the Chief Analytics Officer over there. Brings a wealth of uh, experience in the analytics space. And today he's got you know, an interesting topic to share. Uh, when he initially pulled all this together, it was in a March Madness kind of format because it was going to be right around the tournament. And we decided to stick with it since we all missed March Madness. We thought it would be a good way to share this content and we'd like to keep it collaborative. So please use the, the chat function and the Q&A. We'll be keeping an eye on that. So as Bill goes along, if you have questions or, or need more clarification, go ahead and chime in and we'll make sure we, uh, we touch on those. So with that, I'd like to um, kind of hand it over to Bill to uh, present the intersection of data governance and analytics. Thanks, Bill. All right, thanks, Ken. Let me share this. Should be coming through now, correct? Yep. Excellent. So, um, as Ken mentioned, I, I want to first welcome everybody there. Just looking through the uh, attendees, I can I see a number of names I recognize. So it's uh, good to see both old and familiar faces. Uh, interestingly enough, I think it was that January event uh, where this whole idea came up. I, uh, I attended the event at that brewery, and I remember Ken, you and I, and a couple of folks having conversation about some of your uh, things coming up in the spring, and, and we thought maybe this would be an interesting thing to uh, to give a go. So. Um, you'll see March Madness at the bottom. This was scheduled for March originally. So uh, as Ken said, we decided to stick with it. And it's a slightly different format. Um, and it's really, if, if any of you are old enough like me to remember the old books uh, that were called Choose Your Own Adventure, where you'd get to a point, uh, you know, there's a spooky noise coming from the basement. And if you want to go down in the basement and check it out, you go to page 82. And if you want to run, uh, run out of the house, you go to page 92. And, you know, from there, the decisions branch and you get your own story. This is really what this is going to be about. You guys are literally going to be voting as we go. Um, so here are the rules. I've got a 
set of topics that are uh, related to both governance, which I know is where you focus on, Bill, and also have a tight. Bill, hold yeah. on a second. I think we're having technical difficulties here. Um, okay. Rebecca, I'm getting messages that people can't hear Bill. Yeah, I've checked a few people with a few people and they can. Um, okay. I think we're okay. Let's go ahead. Okay. All right, let's continue forward. So I'm not, uh, I'm not muted on, on the, uh, at the uh, administrator level, right? You guys are hearing me at least? Yeah, no, you're good. Okay. Um, all right, let me know if I need to pause at some point then. I'll, I'll keep going for now. Okay. Um, so there'll be a series of two topics, just like a bracket going head to head. The vote of the room slash Zoom is going to determine which of those topics I'm gonna to do a little rant on and, and give some thoughts. Uh, after each of those rants, you're welcome to uh, ask some questions and, and Ken is, will uh, moderate those. Now the pressure's on because the losing topic, if you don't uh, vote for a topic, if it doesn't win, it is officially banished for the day and I'll never speak of it today unless if at the end there is time, we can go back into a little bit of a loser's bracket and uh, hit some of the more popular topics by vote, uh, even though they happen to lose, they, uh, they, they got a, a decent amount of votes and uh, Ken will help us navigate that. So again, uh, be on your toes, you're gonna be asked to vote multiple times and that will determine the uh, flow of the sections. So the question is, is everybody ready? And since I can't see everyone's face, I will assume so. So let's hop into it. We're ready. Um, we're gonna have five brackets today. I've got one set up around Internet of Things, one around data and metrics, uh, self-service slash enablement, AI, and ethics. Now, before anyone says it, I'm an analytical guy too. You're all seeing it. Yes, I am fully aware that we have an odd number of brackets, which doesn't make any sense. And also some of the brackets have an, uh, don't have the exact same number of competitors in them. That's just simply driven by the format and the time that we, uh, that we have. So I, you know, as it says here, just go with it. Assume for a minute this is a completely clean bracket and it really doesn't matter. It's all, uh, it's all the purpose for fun. So let's go ahead and get started. IoT, here we go. We've got the first two uh, things that are uh, challenge, uh, five challenges of analyzing IoT data or industry standards must be developed. Go ahead and uh, do your vote. You simply have to click on one of the circles uh, and you get to vote one time for your preference and then we'll see uh, what the uh, room has to say. Okay. Five challenges of analyzing IoT data got 65%. All right. Well, we'll call that official. So, Bill, I think we lost you, your voice there. Bill, can you hear me? Just bear with us, folks. We've got a, we're in the world of Zoom here, so mm -hmm. stuff happens sometimes. It is challenge one, yeah.
All right, Bill's just trying to get back on here. I think he had a internet hiccup. Are you able to hear me again, yeah. Ken? Yes, now I can hear you. That was really bizarre. I had sitting here with, with three bars and it, uh, it kicked me out and then it wouldn't let me dial back in. I apologize. What did I said before I dropped? Because I think I uh, said- so, so we were just going into the five challenges um, bracket. Okay. I, and had I don't know if uh, had you heard the mention of if there's any disputes over the results of a given match, or did that get cut off? That got cut off. Yep. Okay. So if anyone wants to dispute the results of a given match, uh, you can take that up with Ken and his legal team following the uh, the session today. So let's get into the first one here. Five challenges of analyzing IoT data. So this is the interesting thing about IoT data is that first, in some ways, it's actually deceptively simple in the sense that it's very, very standardized. When you go back in history, even things like uh, transactional data in the old days, everybody had their own, uh, their own definition of the format of both the layouts and the, what they mean. When you get into IoT, there's a fairly standardized uh, format, the, the JavaScript object, object notation, JSON, that is really simple. It'll give you, you know, this metric is temperature, the value is 110 degrees, for example. Uh, and so regardless of, of what sensor I'm getting or how many readings from a given sensor, the raw process of sucking it in and actually having it, quote, loaded is relatively easy compared to a lot of historical data sets. But that's, where the, that's about where the ease of it ends. You've then got to figure out what's really the proper frequency from a governance perspective that we need to be capturing uh, and analyzing or even and then on the back end storing or not for the long term. And the reason this is tough is that these sensors have the, the technical capability to be blasting things out at millisecond or sometimes even faster than that level. But a lot of applications of, of how you'd use this data don't need anywhere near that level of granularity. And so when you just think about the challenge, uh, you obviously want granularity at a level that will assist you in making the proper decisions. But to get a granularity beyond that, you can end up with orders of magnitude more data than you need. So imagine a manufacturing process wherein you need to be monitoring the, uh, the temperature of a batch of, of stuff. Uh, realistically, you know, you're only gonna be able to react to that on a second by second, maybe every 10, 20 second basis, depending on what actions you have to take. But millisecond by millisecond really doesn't make any sense. So you first just have to figure out what do I even need in terms of my um, uh, cadence? Once you get that, then you have to figure out what kind of patterns you're going for. So let's take an example, um, uh, a fairly easy example. I've got a, uh, an ice cream truck delivering ice cream to uh, some retailers and it's gotta be kept at a certain temperature and or it could just be a warehouse that's storing those ice creams. Obviously, simple patterns like the, uh, the air conditioning or the cooling went out and suddenly the, uh, the freezer has risen from you know, 25 degrees to 50 degrees. That's an obvious problem, easy to find. Everyone knows that's an issue. But the more nuanced things would be examples like, well, there's, there's something going wrong with part of the compressor. It's mostly operating, but it's having some issues. The temperature's kind of going from just below spec, maybe it gets down to 22 degrees when it's supposed to be 25 to 30, and then it rises a little just above spec to 32 instead of the max of 30. So it's never quite totally out of spec to cause a problem. But as you fluctuate between a little too hot, a little too cold again and again, over time, that could actually have just as many quality issues raised as, uh, as a melt. Uh, and I think all of us have had experience like where even in your refrigerator, sometimes ice cream ends up with that kind of crystallized um, nasty um, uh, texture, that's because your, your, your ice cream is actually uh, cooled and froze uh, multiple times. So those complicated patterns are far more difficult uh, to go through. And even when you get to that, how do you even handle and define interactions? Let's assume we agree in an engine, temperature and pressure are going to interact together. Fair enough, but exactly how? So which, which one is actually driving the other? Does a rise in temperature then cause pressure? Or does a rise in pressure cause temperature or can either cause the other? And let's assume we agree that both could cause the other, but what's the, uh, what's the latency between it? If my temperature rises in this instant, how long of a gap before I start to see a notable rise in pressure? And again, this all comes into uh, being very critical 
because if you're having uh, you know very uh, detailed millisecond by millisecond data in that example, um, you need to know where to look for those uh, secondary effects once you see the primary effect, and then see how they how they build on each other. So you not you don't only have to identify the interaction, but what time frame are they in, and then get the magnitude. And last, it's 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 really accounting for errors and missing readings. And what are you you know what are you going to do with those? And and once again, there can be nuances to this. Obviously, if an outdoor thermometer starts showing 200 degrees, you know that it's broken. Um, but things can happen. Let's say one of these. Uh, you know, a big white truck parks itself right next to one of your outdoor measuring stations with the bright sun shining directly onto the side of that white truck, which then reflects onto that uh, thermometer. It could rise the temperature of that thermometer by multiple degrees for an extended period while the truck is parked there and the sun is still at the right general angle. Um, you have to have some ways to account for, boy, well, this, you know, it, it appears to be somewhat reasonable, but it came up very quickly and then later it disappeared. And as we do our analytics, we have to you know, we have to filter some of those out. Uh, I've also heard a great example where uh, when, when uh, organizations are monitoring transportation, uh, like truckers, um, monitoring their fuel usage, monitoring their GPS and their speed, um, so that you can match up that if they really did drive from A to B at this speed, they really should have used this much gas because there's cases where what, what the truckers can do is, you know, either siphon gas off for their own use in their own vehicle, and or they do side trips you know, in, on the company's dime. Um, if you have all that data working perfectly together, you can pretty much say, well, that, that truck obviously uh, didn't have the right level of gas, but once one of those measures goes out, the whole model breaks down. If I can't actually track where you are, knowing your, your speed um, and how much gas you use, I can't, I can't really prove that you did or didn't do anything uh, uh, wrong. And so that, again, it comes down to those decisions. So I'll pause here. Any, uh, Ken, were there any uh, reactions or thoughts on this before we go back to the brackets? Um, no, no specific questions there. I think we can keep moving. All right. Let's go to the second one here. We've got one about governing IoT uh, data and one about who owns IoT data. So again, place your votes. Who owns IoT data? One by fifty-two to forty-eight percent. Cool. Wow, we had a buzzer beater there, guys. So, all right. So, who owns IoT data? All right, this is a good one. So, here's the thing. A lot of, in general, with what we do with analytics and data today, a lot of the um, how to say this, a lot of the regulations and laws simply have not caught up with where we are today in terms of what, what can be done. And so when you get into who owns IoT data, I'll submit to you that actually it almost depends 100% on the contracts that you have set up with the various uh, providers of said devices, or if you're a provider of a device, what, you, what you've said to your customers. And let me just give you an example of, of, of how tricky this can get. Let's, let's take engine uh, aircraft uh, Aircraft engine sensors, sensors embedded in aircraft engines. Um, very common. I might be, say, Rolls-Royce who makes those engines. It would be very reasonable for Rolls-Royce to say, no matter who is, is owning and operating that engine, we have a, a need and we should have access to that data to analyze it for, for understanding how our engines operate, quality, safety, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we'd all say, okay, that, that sounds like a reasonable claim. I could see uh, Rolls-Royce making that claim. Well, now Rolls-Royce sells that engine and then Boeing puts it on a Boeing aircraft. Well, Boeing very similarly could say, well, you know, this is one a very, very important part of these huge aircraft that we're building that we're responsible for. And no matter where our aircraft is, we need to be able to monitor what's coming out of that aircraft as it operates. I think, again, fair enough. I, don't, I think that's plausible. Now, Delta Airlines here in Atlanta buys that airplane, which has that engine. Delta could very similarly say, well, it's our airplane. We are on the hook for the safety of that aircraft, the maintenance of that aircraft on a day-to-day -day basis. We should have all that data. 
And then you can get to, uh, up to the FAA. They could say, hey, we're the government regulators. We need it across all aircraft, all manufacturers, all um, airlines, because we're responsible for the overall safety of the entire uh, airspace and, and network of, of planes. So right there, I'll just stop. But there's four entirely different constituencies, one set of sensor data that all have some plausible claim to that they should have it. And then the question is, which of those four have access? Again, it all comes down uh, to either the contracts and or the legalities. But even at that, it gets murky because having access to it doesn't mean that any analysis is necessarily fair game. So I don't think people would like uh, if Boeing came up with a program to, go, to analyze uh, airlines head to head and then go as a third party data service, sell their assessment of which airlines are doing a better job of maintaining their aircraft. So, you know, maybe Delta would pay a lot to Boeing to be able to say Boeing validated that American does a lot worse job at maintaining their engines than we do. I don't think anyone would think that was a proper use of that data for Boeing, even though they do have proper use. So it's not as simple as who owns the data. I believe it also has to be looked at. You have access to the data for some legitimate purposes, but I but you also have to think what are the bounds of those legitimate purposes for any given person or organization that has access to that data. And I think you'll find there's also a lot of limits there that you have to think about. So this can get very, very uh, tricky very fast. So, so it really depends. If there's not really a standard kind of answer around who owns the data. I mean, what about the example, like a lot of car insurance companies, right? They, they can install devices to track how they're, you know, um, the ins- you know, people insured are driving, right? So um, yep. I guess, I guess, you know, that, that's all in the contracts with the insurance companies then so that they can have access to that. Is that kind of the. Right. It, it, you're signing up and giving them access for that data for that purpose. But for example, I'd sure like to see it that it's used explicitly only for this purpose because that car insurance company, again, if you didn't have policies spelled out and you left it open-ended, they could say, hey, healthcare companies, I'm willing to tell you which of the healthcare clients do you have are driving faster on a regular basis than the others because they're a, you know, they're a higher risk for life insurance or healthcare or any number of other things and right. you should charge them more. I think that even if you saw a benefit in having them monitor you for the auto insurance purposes, most people would have a bit of a, a problem if they were doing that other type of sharing and analysis. Um, and so that's where it gets down to, you've really got to look in, in, in the contracts because the, the fact is there's so much data uh, out there now coming in from sensors and so many different places it's coming from. There, there just simply aren't really regulations on it other than some of these very broad privacy regulations, which again, you could meet the standards of GDPR by actually stating that it's open what you might use that data for in some way or being wording it in a way that the average person might not really realize, oh, they're going to go tell my life insurance company how fast I'm, you know, how fast I'm driving. So I think to have that, that transparency is just, uh, you know, super critical here. We, we do have a question based on your, your example okay. before that you gave. So can, um, Bob Dow was asking, can Rolls Royce charge the FAA for use of the data if there's really nothing you know in a contract between those entities how does that tip how would something like that play out um or is it usually spelled out yeah i think again now in the faa's case because it is a government entity there might be I, i just don't know there could be a law that says that either the airline or or the manufacturer or the aircraft engine manufacturer has to provide that data to the faa In absence of that, though, then back to it. I think it becomes a contractual thing. So can Rolls-Royce charge Boeing and can Boeing charge Delta? Could Delta charge FAA? Again, in theory, you could see that that's a possible contractual setting, but I don't know that there's an absolute right answer to that either, right? We might all say we personally find it distasteful or not for some of them to charge the other, Um, but at the end of the day, um, there's nothing, you know, if there's nothing inherently illegal about it, then it comes down to your contract. And so that's why I think it just gets super important to think about, especially if you're on governance in an organization, if you're bringing sensors in and or shipping sensor data out, you really want to think about not just the internal governance of that, but also how are you making sure that who you're receiving it from or who you're shipping it to is also going to be following standards that you're uh, in fact comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. All right, let's, uh, let's move to the next, uh, next bracket. Yeah. So here's the uh, data and metrics rant bracket. 
So choose the right metric to optimize or governments, gov, gov, governance is like home maintenance. You need like the Jeopardy music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's right. choose the right metrics to optimize by 64 to 36%. All right. Excellent. So let's go in there. Whoops. Here we go. So this is a, this is a great one because this I think ties to uh, just common business sense in many ways, but it is also very much a governance issue, which is what are you really trying to optimize? And even when you've chosen a path, that path might have made perfect sense at one point uh, in where your business was, or even at one point, given what data is available, and that could change. So this is a real example of a, of a company I worked with, and they make the tires that are on this these mining trucks here. And, and this is a bit deceptive, um, the tires we're talking about are on these massive mining trucks that are of a scale you would never see on a road. These tires are 10 to 12 feet high each. They're massive and they cost six figures each. Every tire is over $100,000. So uh, originally in the old days, they really wanted to keep their maintenance uh, down because when you have to replace a $100,000 tire, that hurts. Um, and then the, the maintenance on these big trucks just being down, all of that was painful. So they attempted to balance uh, and keep the maintenance to um, a, a reasonable level. But they started to have sensors throughout the, uh, the vehicles, much like others. And someone had the, the idea of, you know, really what we're trying to do here is optimize the output from the mine, not explicitly minimize our costs. Certainly, we don't want to have crazy costs while we do it. But at the end, the more uh, material we get out of that mine at a profitable level, the better. And they did a bunch of analysis using this data and found that, in fact, you could load the trucks down with about 30% more weight on each trip be, uh, uh, while still uh, making more net profit. Now, of course, in doing that, you were going through a lot more tires and more, more maintenance on the, on the trucks. Um, but the, the extra 30% or whatever percent it was they were pulling out more than made up for those additional costs. So in this case now, they said, well, we're going to change and optimize this other component. But along with that came the organizational re-education of this will make us more money. We'll be able to demonstrate that. However, all of our old benchmarks in terms of what kind of tire uh, replacement and repair and general truck replacement and repair should be happening, they're all going to go up. This is planned, though. This is known. We're, we're doing it on purpose. And what you'll see is that the, uh, the output of the mine is going to increase by more than enough to offset this. And it ended up, of course, it you know, went pretty well. But that shows why it's important not just to set and forget metrics, but always be looking at uh, and questioning um, as new data becomes available or, or your business, uh, your business uh, changes imagined during COVID. There could be a lot of assumptions people are optimizing towards right now that given the state of business right now, at least in the short term, don't really make any sense anymore. And you might want to consider updating some of your processes to optimize something different. But this, you know, this isn't a set it and forget it kind of scenario. And in this case, you know, they could have left who knows how much money on the ground over the past few years since they implemented this change. If someone hadn't had the uh, foresight to say, let's go see now that we have this additional data, what it tells us. Now, that's a that's a great example, Bill. And I think, you know, just in my own personal experience, you know, going into different companies, it's amazing how many metrics companies have and they run, you know, weekly or monthly. And, you know, you start to ask questions you know, what decisions are made off of this or how is this, how are these metrics used? And, you know, it, it's just amazing how much um, overhead a lot of these efforts have and they're not really getting the value from those metrics. Right. So, um, I, I love your idea of, you know, really thinking about what's the desired outcome or what's the value you're trying to uncover and then kind of tailoring the metrics to support that. That's really critical here. All right. See what our next one in this bracket is. Inconsistent definition definitions can wreak havoc where data retention is no longer a binary issue.
inconsistent definitions can wreak havoc by 64 to 36% again. Nice. All right. Well, this one is actually another one that I, I believe this ties, ties uh, nicely as it ends up with the last one that everyone chose. So uh, I'll, I'll base this on a, on a, on a true, uh, true story. You know, one of the things, and, and I know that the analytics organizations that I deal with the most struggle with this, but I know every governance uh, person I've ever talked to struggles as well, right? Why don't we have a single definition, right? Revenue should be revenue. And, and on the one level, that absolutely makes sense. On the other hand, there are sometimes legal or policy or business unit uh, specific things that actually necessitate additional definitions. The key is to understand that there are those differences. So one example here, I, I, I was doing some work with a large hospital uh, organization. They had uh, many different hospitals in their network, some of which uh, had been acquired over, many, over the years, some of which they had stood up. A lot of them had their, you know, had different uh, patient types they specialized in, so very different, and, and they, therefore they had different things. And so, you know, one of the, one of the metrics that you use uh, when evaluating a hospital, for example, is, you know, the cost per, uh, per night stay, in a, you know, much like a room night in a hotel, a room night in, in, a, in a hospital, what does it cost to have a patient stay um, overnight? Well, when they dug in, they realized that there were really different um, measures and, uh, or, or numbers put forth by the different uh, hospitals, and it ends up, they all had reasonable definitions, but they were different. So let me just give you a couple examples. How could you define how many days I'm in the hospital? One could be every calendar day that I'm physically in a bed, it counts. Um, and, and, and let's say I go from 8 a.m., uh, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. I stay, you know, I get, I get, I get an accident tonight. And I'm in there till tomorrow morning. Well, under that uh, metric, I'm there for two days. I'm there today. I'm there tomorrow. You could also say anytime you cross midnight counts as a day. Under that term, I'm there for one day. Now, the interesting thing there is I could be there as little as 10 minutes from 11.55 to 12.05, or as much as you know, 47 hours and 59 minutes coming in at 12.01 one day and leaving at 11.59 the next, and that would still count as one. You could also say, well, let's go ahead and do based on hours, percentage of a day. I'm there 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's a one half day. That's one half. Sounds very reasonable as well. Each of those are, are defensible, but if you notice, the difference between the, the highest, which was two, and the lowest, which is a half, is 4x. So right there, just based on having two both reasonable but both different definitions, you could have a 4x difference in the reported statistics that are then ostensibly going to be compared between two hospitals. It's obviously not a fair comparison. A more nuanced example, if you go to uh, insurance, let's say you're, you're uh, in, in healthcare insurance now. Let's flip to the other side of the health space. You want to do metrics on cost per member per month. So let's think about this for a moment. What is the member count this month? Is it whoever's a member as of the first of the month? That's the count for the month. Works great, except what if you land a, a Fortune 1000 company with 20,000 employees mid-month? Suddenly you have another 100,000 employees thrown on mid-month who are going to start having a couple weeks worth of costs, but they're not counted as a member. And so it inflates the costs of the members that were there at the beginning of the month. Similarly, if you said it's whoever was there at the end of the month, well, what happens when that 100,000 uh, company uh, cancels in the middle of that month and moves to somewhere else? Now you have the opposite problem. You're going to have a inflated um, uh, policyholder count where they and your numbers on, on delivery of service will go down because of the fact that they weren't there for the whole period. And no matter where you draw that line of how you define the member count for that month, you're, you're going you're gonna to have some kind of issue. So again, it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's that they're going to be different. And then you have to be aware from a governance perspective when one of those unusual circumstances happen. On a typical month, it probably really won't matter except to rounding error how you uh, defined it as mid-month, beginning month, end of month. But that, that month where you actually land the 100,000 member company or lose that 100,000 member company, it could make a very substantive difference in those. And you need to then be able to identify and flag that and say, hey, this month you're going to notice a drop in, in cost per, per share uh, policyholder or a rise in cost per shareholder, but that's because of the nuance that company X, you know, either left or came in the middle of the month. And so, you know, if, uh, uh, if we take them out of the mix, we just remove them as a company and all the claims related to them, here's what the adjusted number would be based on the typical thing. And that would probably be more comparable. But those are where you get into these things where, you know, these different definitions might exist for a reason. You might not be able to get rid of them. But even as you accept that they might be there, you still have to be on the lookout for the cases where 
that any given metric can break based on those unusual circumstances. And if you don't count for that, you know, I've seen really bad decisions made because of what later ended up being an anomaly that certainly wasn't typical, but it wasn't at all how it was interpreted either. You know, someone panicked or got excited about an effect that, that it ends up wasn't the effect from what they thought. It was, it was one of these unusual circumstances. Yep. Okay. Let's move to the next all one. Right. I think we're getting to the next bracket here, right? Yeah. All right, self-servicement and enablement. <coughs> Excuse me. First bracket, the real value and proposition of visualization tools or self-service is not the same as self-sufficiency. Oh, there we go. I teed it up. I figured <laughs> it should have, should have been more prepared for that. <laughs> So the real value proposition of visualization tools, 60 to 40 percent. 60 to 40. All right. So this is an interesting one. I still recall, and this is a 100% uh, true story. Back, um, as Ken mentioned, I spent a lot of years at, uh, at, at, at uh, Teradata. And when you're at a large company like that, you know, new vendors are always trying to partner and, and, and get traction. And I, I remember our first meeting with uh, what was, I, I guess, really the first, let's call it uh, modern visualization tool Tableau when they were still, I think, less than 100 people. And, and I remember when they convinced us to take the meeting, you know, we have some ex-Disney people and we have some ex, uh, I forget which of the big uh, reporting tools of the day they had come from. And we've got a unique approach and, and, and we met with them. And, I, and, and over time, I saw our clients start to adopt tools like a tab, you know, a Tableau. There's a, a, many others these days, ClickView, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're all out there. And the, and the, and the big vendors have started to, uh, traditional vendors have also added a lot of these capabilities. But I remember I'd go in and I'd, I'd look at, at, at somebody's uh, uh, analysis and go, hey, Bill, I want to show you this. This is so awesome. And they showed me, you know, maybe it, it's their Tableau output. And you know what it was? It was a pie chart with a little table, a little bar chart. And, you know, first, like, well, this is really interesting. It's pretty much a lot of the same looking stuff that they were always having. Only maybe it looks a little prettier. Um, and, and a lot of people got too hung up on these visualization tools being about just being pretty, which it's true, but that wasn't really the key. Then number two was that a lot of classic reports uh, ha had been defined such that you would look at them to see how your decisions performed. We did a campaign, let's go see how it did. The, uh, what, what these visualization tools that were in people's hands that let them do a little more interactivity allowed it to be used more proactively on the front end of a decision maybe than in the past. They, they were able to go in maybe and, and play around a little bit more um, and help make a decision. And that, that was a big part of it. But even that wasn't the main value prop. What finally hit me was, even though these reports looked a lot like what they had always had, and even though someone from uh, IT could come and argue, this is almost the same report we had in number report 152. It just has another metric from report 722 or whatever. The real value prop in my mind was that they could analyze the data as they saw fit, not as someone else allowed them. And this gets back to that, that governance. By, by allowing people the flexibility within bounds that these tools do, where you're letting them go in and dig through that data and look at the metrics they want to and piece it together even visually how they want. When they get to their answer, they're completely bought into it. They're excited about it. They're ready to go talk about it. It's that freedom that really was what was exciting to people. Sure, the graphics were great. Sure, it's great that they were also adding it into a little more of the upfront decision-making process, but it really was that enablement and that, that self-service nature of being able to go get your own insights and then apply them and or you know, show them to, to others. That was the real... Uh, in my mind, value prop of, uh, of this class of tool. And that's only continued to accelerate. Yep. Okay. So ensuring analytics are used correctly or research and development is not hacking.
ensuring that analytics are used correctly, 73%, 27 for research and development are not random. Wow. All right. Well, that one was a blowout. So let's see. This is actually a, a, a very interesting one. And again, ties into how do, you, how do you govern and control these analytics while letting value come through? And the key here is that uh, I think at times the enablement and self-service can go a little bit too far with everyone uh, focused on, we want everyone in our company to be uh, doing analytics and, and, and the doing being the operative word, as opposed to we want everyone in the company having their decisions influenced through analytics. Those are two very different things, doing analytics and making decisions through analytics. And what this means is that People should not uh, necessarily be trained on how analytics work, how even some of these tools work versus given that we do these analytics, here's how you use it on your jobs. So let's just take an example. I'm a, a salesman at a car dealership. Do I need to, or do you even want me to try to understand the various models that are predicting what upsells to give to the customer I'm talking to? Or do you simply want me to know, hey, we're going to be running some analysis and when you enter their information in, we're going to come back and tell you whether we think they're a comfort person or a performance person. And if we say comfort person, play up the, the, the higher end seat, uh, seat coverings and so forth. If they're a performance person, talk about the, uh, the, the, the high end tires that we have as an option on this vehicle. That person doesn't need to understand how any of that works. What they need to do is understand, great, I'm going to follow that recommendation. And if those recommendations are being done well, they'll hopefully see, you know, what's really cool about this, I'm actually selling both more tires and more seat upgrades because it does appear to be targeting the right person in some cases where I just, I just didn't know. Same kind of example, you know, a call center person needs to deliver the message. They don't need to understand why that message is being asked to be delivered. And as you move up the chain, people start to have to understand a little bit more. Obviously, if you're, you know, uh, head of the digital team, you probably want to understand a little bit more the, the details of how A-B tests are getting set up and analyzed and so on and so forth. Um, but you don't necessarily have to understand all of the math underneath it. The, the, the data scientists or analytics people setting those up, of course, then do. So I think this is just the important point here is that um, even as you, as you look to, to, to govern the access to the data and the analytics, it's, uh, it's about enabling the people to do what they should be doing. It's not necessarily giving them full broad access. So a real simple example here is some people, whether it's a, whether it's a website or a visualization tool, might only be able to go in and, as in the old days, open predefined uh, projects and, and ask them to be refreshed and possibly have a few click downs in geography, whatever the case may be. Other people may have some very rudimentary ability to define metrics or, or, or change the layout of the reports. And then you have your power users who might, who might almost be able to do full scale, you know, joining of uh, different sources on the fly if that's part of their reasonable role and they have the right uh, training and expertise. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I think the, the user personas are different and you need to take the time to define those and really set up access based on that. Um, oh. it, it mitigates a ton of risk if you can do that. So very good point. As we go down, I think we've got a third one here. Democratizing data science is not as risky as people fear or there will still be someone supervising. Democratizing right. data science is not as risky as many fear, 77%. All right. You know, and, and I, we never knew who, what you're going to do, but this actually ties really well to the last one in that it's going to, to go to the other extreme about people uh, doing more fancy stuff. So here's the interesting thing. I had a question asked of me when I was talking about this uh, a, a couple months back. I remember someone said, you know, hey, Bill, People pretty much accept that that BI classic reporting is, is is probably safe to democratize, but you know data science seems a little bit more risky. And and as I absorbed that question, uh, I, I came back with the answer that I've actually uh, sometimes you surprise yourself because you really like your answer that you'd never thought about before until someone asked you. And I still stick by this. I said, well, 
I think your, your, your premise is flawed in that it, 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 it's, it's not completely true. Today, it is true that now a lot of people or most would say that basic BI functionality can be safely democratized, but that was not always the case. In fact, you know, years back, it wasn't at all safe to do and nobody would have thought it was. You had highly technical tools that you had to be in, um, still, you know, doing a little bit of coding in some cases, even within a supposed uh, GUI-based uh, tool. Now, over time, as those tools became uh, more sophisticated, more standardized, had better user interfaces, it did become where it was safe to uh, democratize uh, some of those. So that is true today, but it's an evolution. So I like to use it to think about cooking. You go back 150 years, uh, cooking wasn't really democratized. You had to know what the heck you were doing. You want to bake a cake, you've got to get the flour, you've got to get the eggs, you've got to mix it all in the right proportions yourself, and then you've got to pop it in an oven that's run by coal or wood that has very limited ability to really uh, control that temperature. I mean, you had to know what you were doing to bake a cake. But let's call cake a BI, you know, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward recipe. We've had cake mixes for decades. Those cake mixes, even someone who doesn't know what they're doing, you pour it in, you mix the water, toss in an egg, you put it in your cake pan, put it in your oven, that'll perfectly keep the exact temperature they tell you for the full 45 minutes and you've got an awesome cake. It's kind of hard to screw it up. But then people go, yeah, but, but, but that's for basic stuff like a cake. We could never democratize a gourmet meal. Well, now we have these meal kits you can order, albeit expensive but they'll send you gourmet ingredients with a recipe and then maybe a YouTube video that goes along that even shows you how to do it in addition to the, the instructions. And I might be able to make some kind of Asian stir fry meal uh, that is almost approaching a restaurant quality if I follow those instructions and use their exact ingredients. Now, that doesn't mean if I decide to go and create my own, I'm gonna do a very good job because they've spoon fed me the exact ingredients with the exact way to put it together at the exact temperature and timings. But it's still, we can now cook things we never would have imagined. This is kind of where data science is. It's behind uh, in terms of the sophistication of the tools. But there's a lot of data science tools out there now that really allow you to access functionality. And you can let people, for example, go in and say, you can predict one of these three things, uh, churn, uh, in the, either churn or growth in the next 30, 60, or 90 days for a given product line, whichever one you want. And we have standardized modeling processes back there. You can pick whatever one you need and we'll update our, uh, our standard modeling process. Someone had to define those modeling process. Someone had to define those ingredients, just like the gourmet meals. But now that person who's operating that is actually creating a true uh, statistical model that's well governed because it had a preset recipe, it had preset constraints, but it's not necessarily at all that risky. And in fact, to the extent you can get people doing the, the stuff that's pretty well standardized, it frees up the team that otherwise would have had to do those to go out and tackle new things that then over time, as they're no longer new, they could also be democratized. So I think it's really important to always be pushing your limits and, and, and understand that, that the, the governance level that made sense one year and two years ago may not make sense anymore. Even if you have the same toolkits, they've had updates and they've had enhancements that might well have changed the rules, much like that truck example from Big O the Tires. Maybe today you can enable more people to do more things than, than uh, you could have done and would have felt safe doing a year or two ago, but you don't want to leave that opportunity on the table. And so you really have to take fresh looks at this. Okay. Now, Ken, I guess what I'll say is I think we've got two brackets left. We'll probably have time for one. We're either going to have to do the AI bracket or we can do the, um, uh, or we can do the uh, ethics bracket. I'd, I'd like to do the AI bracket. I think it'll be, uh, be AI. Amazing. All right. Yeah. Plus I like the picture right. you have there. It's good. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, so context is critical or AI still has gaps. Actually, at a tie, 50 wow. 50. So, context right. is critical, and AI today still has gaps. So, so in this case, it's a tie. We go into overtime, and as Ken is the official 
referee today, uh, Ken, you have to make the decision on whether that buzzer beater counted or not. Who, uh, who wins the game? Yeah, we're going to go with AI today still has gaps. All right. And again, if anyone wants to dispute that, you may take it up with Ken and his legal team following the session today. So, AI still has gaps. This is what's really intriguing to me, is how, even as we keep hearing all, all the levels of sophistication that are increasing, which, uh, you know, 100% true, don't get me wrong. I'm not, uh, I'm not meaning to, to, to downplay that in any way, shape, or form. But there's still so much that needs to happen. So one example uh, 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 that I've read about is, you know, you can teach AI, and they taught AI a while ago to be able to play piano, for example. And, he, uh, and the, the key is when a person plays piano, they can add some emotion into it, depending on where they hit a little harder, a little softer, et cetera. And the early AI, it would literally play the exact notes at the exact right time, but it wouldn't sound right at all because there wasn't that expressive uh, component. Another, another example is uh, with autonomous vehicles. Some of the early challenges are that you teach uh, AI under a set of constraints and a set of goals and a set of rules. That's what we learn. But then there's all sorts of things that we account for that aren't in the official rules. So imagine a four-way stop sign. We know how this works. The official law, I think, in virtually every state, I know it is here, whoever gets to the four-way stop first, after they completely stop, and they make sure the other cars have stopped, they go. And then you kind of get in this round robin thing and everybody's polite. And normally that is true. But we all know that sometimes somebody comes up and they think they're in too much of a hurry to wait for you and they nudge their way through. Sometimes there's someone not paying attention because you can tell they're looking at their phone or, or their GPS and it's their turn, but they wait and they wait. So eventually you're just going to go because they're not paying attention. The problem is the autonomous vehicles were programmed on those rules initially. So they get to a stop sign and they sit there almost forever because they keep getting confused by the fact that by the time they, maybe by the time the, the, the car was waiting too long to make sure everyone stopped, which made someone believe they were hesitating. So someone would always go first and they'd be trapped. The other thing is, we would know that even though we're both stopped, I see you kind of nudging forward inch by inch. I know that that nudge forward inch by inch is you getting ready to go right behind me, but you're not actually coming into the intersection. You're just being a little impatient and it's safe for me to go. The AI originally, of course, considered that, oh, that inch by inch, they're coming into the intersection. Again, they would stop and they get frozen. So it's, it's, it's how do you teach them those, those higher levels of complexity uh, and particularly when uh, it's outside of the rules that are, that are typical. And, you know, the one example I always used back in the days when I was, you know, coding all day was I used to say, I can get coded what I need coded to do what I want when everything works as it should in about 10% of my time. The idiot and airproof that code was 90% because you have to think about how, what is every way that the data could come in wrong or the something could go wrong as I'm passing it around or that somebody could, um, you know, use the interface that it was going to be used through wrong very, very difficult. And so I think this is where the, there are some of these gaps where even as you see AI doing amazing things, there are cases where you shake your head and wonder how it could do something so stupid, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, when you see the full, the, the, the full list of what it has done. Yep. So I think we'll do, uh, let's see. We'll do the last one here and kind of wrap it up. Yeah. So what happens under the hood and a core bias of AI? Core bias of AI by 71 to 29%. All right. So this is true of, of, of AI. It's true of other analytical methods as well. But I think at times uh, it, it, it can get lost in, in AI because of the fact that uh, some of the opaqueness of the AI algorithms allows us to pretend this isn't there. Um, but this is the fact that any model we're building that's going to be used forward looking, one of the big assumptions, and again, this is, a, this is a, 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 an issue of how you govern the use of the data and the use, uh, both creation and use of the models, is that you're using that past data for, to predict the future. A, an inherent assumption there is that that past data is still relevant. So let's take two examples. Um, college admissions. 
it, college admissions models built on, say, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years of data that look at test scores, look at GPAs, look at activities, and, and then say, which of these students that have applied this year look most likely to graduate within four years with, a, with good grades uh, compared to the others? That sounds great, but the inherent assumption there is that what it takes to succeed in college entering in 2020 is the same as it took entering in 2000. That might be true. It might not be true. And if you go back, let's say, especially if you're using 20-year-old data, in 2000, the internet was still dial-up. Most people didn't have it. Um, you were going to have, you know, 100% classroom-based instruction, nothing online unless you went to the computer lab. Um, it was a very different world. It could be the same overall skills and the same needs still apply, but it's a question you have, you absolutely would want to validate. Is that data still appropriate? Uh, we also get back to the same thing here. I've talked to some clients even now, even basics like marketing mix models. Do you even want to use your current marketing mix models in an environment like today? Because it's so different from when those models were built and the data they're based on and the market assumptions that they were based on that they could do you more harm than good potentially because the, the promotions aren't going to behave the same. Obviously, sales aren't going the same. There's a lot of things. And then you can get into real issues of, of, of fairness even. Uh, there's, you know, there's algorithms that will predict uh, what a sentence ought to be for a judge. You know, here's a, here's a, a defendant who's been convicted of X, Y, Z. Here's their past record. Here's the other history about them. What's a fair sentence? And, and ostensibly, that's a good thing because the judge, when there's a lot of leniency between one and five years, let's say, we'll see, oh, historically, someone like this would have only had 18 months. All right. And maybe they round up or down from that. But think about it. There are certain areas of society where we are either actively increasing or actively decreasing the level of punishment for certain activities. So imagine a marijuana possession, right? It's flat out legal in some states now. In other states, it's certainly loosened. The point is, if we're building a model based on and includes data from five, even five or six years ago on marijuana sentencing, today it's very likely to overpunish someone for what they've done because uh, the underlying factors have changed. And, and there could be examples, too, where we've tightened up on certain behaviors, right? I remember when I was younger was when they really started to tighten up on drunk driving. You would not have wanted to build a model on how to punish a drunk driver five years ago uh, when I was growing up compared to five years later because, you know, at, at, at one point it was pretty much what, how they would deal with it is, the, the, you know, they, they'd make you pull over and, and uh, call your parents to come and pick you up or a friend to come pick you up, and it wasn't enforced. And that sounds shocking today, but that's just how it was back then. And so it's just very important to understand uh, that, and, and think through how some of that, that, that bias is going to be embedded in the data and then how it's going to be applied. And, and things like AI make it much easier to forget about that than some of the classic models where it's more in your face that A is predicting B. Um, and a very explicit formula. So where you might go, well, this, this doesn't it make as much sense because I, I didn't think that factor should have as much influence or historically it hadn't. You know, if you've got a, a, an opaque uh, uh, neural network, for example, it, it, it could be much harder to, to, to do that validation. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I mean, I think we're, we're coming up against time. So, you know, Bill, I wanted to thank you for presenting this. I, I really think the format was, was great to get a lot of content across in the hour uh, and very good examples and stories. I think, uh, you know, it really makes you think and I, I think people can kind of have some tangible takeaways from this. So um, Bill's got his contact information up here if anyone wants to connect with him or reach out. He does have a series of books as well. So where are your books for sale, Bill? Are they on Amazon? Yeah, I mean, Amazon or, or, or other booksellers. There's a new one actually coming. I think right now the official release date is mid-August. Uh, it's with O'Reilly Media. It's called 97 Things About Ethics That Data Scientists Should Know. Um, and it's a, it's a compilation book with uh, viewpoints from, uh, you know, literally many dozens of people around the industry on on ethics and the uh, analytics data science space that uh, uh, obviously there's a, there's entire pieces around uh, that tie into governance very tightly as well. So I don't have that captured here yet. I think they only just finished the cover last week, but uh, that'll be coming out soon if anyone's interested in that, particularly given we didn't get to, to the ethics bracket today. Uh, that's a way to, to, to get to ethics uh, through that. All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Bill. And thanks to all the attendees. Uh, hope you got some value out of it and, uh, We'll keep you informed of future events. So thank you and have a good rest of your day.